I'm Deacon Tim O'Donnell, Program Director here, and I'm delighted to welcome you, both those with us in person here at St. Paul's in Harvard Square, and our virtual audience joining us through Zoom. Tonight, we continue a series of public lectures which engage a theme that has both enduring and pressing significance, human work and its relation to faith. Let me begin by saying a brief word about the Harvard Catholic Forum. Our mission is to share the riches of Catholic thought and culture with the academic, artistic, and professional worlds of Boston, Cambridge, and beyond. In addition to our lectures, we offer non-credit courses and are continuing to broaden our programming. The forum is a project of the Harvard Catholic Center, St. Paul's Parish, Harvard Square, and the St. Paul's Choir School. Together, we make up a vibrant Catholic presence in the midst of the Harvard campus. Check out our website at harvardcatholicforum.org, where you can sign up for our newsletters, register for future events, and please consider supporting our mission by making a financial contribution. Work. This is actually what most of us will spend most of our lives doing more than anything else. Work understood in its total reality, not only a job for a paycheck, but taking care of others, household work, and tasks we take on as volunteers. In this series, the Harvard Catholic Forum addresses this fundamental sphere of our lives with insights from a variety of perspectives. The biblical vision, Catholic social thought, the theological tradition, and the Catholic anthropology and spirituality. In bringing these events to you, we are thankful for the co-sponsorship of the Theology of Work Project, the Lumen Christi Institute at the University of Chicago, the Collegium Institute at the University of Pennsylvania, and the Human Flourishing Program at Harvard's Institute for Advanced Quantitative Science. Please note, this event will be archived on the Harvard Catholic Forum YouTube channel. If you like what you see and hear, please share it with friends, colleagues, parishes, or chaplaincies that may be interested. Our post-talk YouTube participation always exceeds the numbers we are able to reach on day one. Before I introduce our speaker, let me give you a roadmap of tonight's event. The lecture segment will last 30 minutes or so, and then we will have an opportunity for some Q&A. Those of you who are here in person should have received a note card and pencil when you came in. If you have a question, please write it on the card. At about eight o'clock, some of our student fellows will come through up the aisles and collect the cards and bring them to me. I will pass on as many of these questions as I can. Unfortunately, we are not set up technically to take questions from our virtual audience at the same time. Tonight's speaker, Dr. Kevin Majors, has served on the faculty of Harvard Medical School for the past decade, teaching cognitive behavioral therapy to psychiatrists in training at the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. He trained in med medicine and psychiatry at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical School. He is the co-founder co of Optimal Work, which can be found at optimalwork.com. And it provides training and resources in a psychology of challenge to both individuals and institutions. And he also has a private clinical practice in Harvard Square. We announced tonight's talk as Psychological Skills and Catholic Vision at Work. And that tells you what the talk is about. But Dr. Majors, ever the consummate wordsmith, has reframed the title as Faith and Psychology Working Together. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Kevin Majors. Thank you, Deacon Tim, for the introduction. As mentioned, I'm Dr. Kevin Majors. I'm a psychiatrist. My specialty has traditionally been anxiety disorders and working with people one-on-one -on -one to help them 
overcome the most significant disorders as rapidly as possible. So as a cognitive behavioral therapist, I specialized in doing exposure therapy. And my main concern with patients was, how do I make this as fast and as painless as it could be? And I found that there were three steps that made this very effective. Probably the biggest eureka moment, though, for me, was when I realized studying the literature on flow and work, that those are the exact same three steps that bring you to flow. One of the best strengths we can have is our ability to work. The ability to work at your very best when you want to. Wouldn't it be a wonderful thing to be able to sit down and go into flow whatever? But that is attainable. The normal thing that holds people back is that they are in what I call threat mode. When you're in threat mode, you might not have a huge alarm sounding with it. You know, racing heart and sweating and trembling. But part of you is hyper vigilant for things to go wrong. You're quick to see the negative side of things. You get into a spiral of complaining or feeling overwhelmed. You start to feel like you have to rush and there's not enough time to do things. And the more frazzled you get, the more difficult it is to get anything done. So threat mode is a kind of trap that people fall into, and it can become very chronic. Chronically, it leads to anxiety disorders of whatever form, to attention deficit, which I think can best be thought of as a chronic threat mode, and to addictive disorders, where people seek escapes from the sense that they're constantly being a, a, under assault or there's a threat hanging over them. So I wanna go through tonight is one, how to understand how threat mode works. That's a very brief discussion, I think. But in the midst of that discussion, I will show you a model that helps you learn how to overcome any anxiety. It's actually a very robust model. There's nothing in psychiatry more research than this model I'm showing you, because it's what lies behind all safety learning, habituation, desensitization research. It's the best treatments in psychiatry will have this model. Second, to go through an approach that I call the golden hour, which by which I mean, what do you do with your mind when you sit down and work? How do you prepare internally? Not just external strategies, but something that only depends on how you are using your mind to be able to go into your highest state of focus. People call flow. And this is going to have three steps, reframing, mindfulness, and embracing the challenge, which is cognitive therapy, mindfulness-based therapies, and behavior therapy. So this is just a summary of all of cognitive behavioral therapy put into a couple minutes before you start work. But because it's repeated in the very midst of your life, it goes very deep. And then I'm going to be at the all the way through, I'm going to be commenting on how these skills relate to the spiritual life and actually to the traditional heights of the spiritual life. They can be, when you understand, even the highest stages of prayer. So we'll get into these questions briefly. So there's, I think, there's ample opportunity for questions. It all starts with an organ deep in our brain called the amygdala. And the amygdala's job is to automa it's automatically detecting threats. When it detects that there's a threat present or looming, it could be a thought that crossed your mind, it could be a sound you heard, it could be uh, someone knocking on the door asking you, hey, do you have a moment? Whatever it might be, your amygdala detects this as a threat and starts to then sound the alarm. That alarm people experience as anxiety. It could be very small, it could be very large. At the higher levels, you get high levels of adrenaline with that. But then your amygdala watches your response to see what do you do? If it sees that you are approaching the supposed threat, that's going to feed back and decrease the threat label the next time, producing safety. 
But if it seems you're avoiding the supposed threat or trying to protect yourself or lessen it in any way, that is going to feed back and increase the threat label for next time. And that's called threat intervening. You can also say it's you know, the approach produces desensitization and avoidance produces sensitization. I just like to have this discussed because this is the basis for how we deal with anxiety. What is the threat? And then how do you show your amygdala that you're approaching it? But these three steps, detecting the threat, sounding the alarm, and watching the response, will contain the whole kernel of everything else we're going to talk about. Because this is where reframing and mindfulness and challenge are deep within how our mental works. You couldn't have an alarm state when, you, when your amygdala is sounding the alarm and you experience that your heart racing. And we've all had that from time to time. But more common is the alert state or hyper alert state that I call that we call threat mode. You also have a calm state which is when you feel like yourself. It's the chronic small activation of your threat detector that leads to irritability, to being overwhelmed, to being distractible. All of those things that we'll go and I'll show you more about what threat mode is, but all of that is a result of your amygdala continually not feeling safe. And as a result, you don't feel safe. So you're on edge. What that does to your thinking is it biases your thoughts to perceive threats. Everything starts to become hard and threatening. It also makes your strategies, your approach to this thing more rigid. Because if things are unpredictable and unsafe, it's not the time to innovate. It's not the time to be creative. So you end up getting rigidly fixed in a road way of doing and then you get more and more stuck in a rut as you're, as you're in this road state. And you will tend to have a more fixed mindset about yourself. You'll be continually worrying about if you measure up in some like quasi-objective way to the demands being placed on you. Your attention will have these three marks. You'll be very distractible. You'll tend to multitask and you'll tend to rush. Now, distractible makes sense. If you were in a situation where, let's say, I don't know, you're in a strange city late at night during a riot, walking down a dark alley, you, you shouldn't be able to read Jane Austen at the same time on, like, on your phone like, and like, understand what you're doing. Okay. So, it'd be in, so when, you're, when there are potential threats, not jumping out, which would make you alarmed, but lurking potentially, then you're in threat mode. And you should be distractible and impulsive because being distractible and impulsive, having attention deficit hyperactivity actually is a survival advantage. So you need to respond quickly. So when people are feeling stressed out, they tend to get more distractible because they're on the lookout. And then they tend to rush and multitask. You feel like you have to do more things and try to be more effective, more efficient. And you end up then getting to this last stage where feeling overwhelmed. This is the more behavioral part. You start to feel like all the challenges are outside of you. This is a very strange psychological kind of concept, the focus of challenge. When you're feeling overwhelmed and you can't handle it, does it feel like the challenge is within your own will? Or does it feel like it's being pressed on you from outside? You feel it externally. It is passive. And this tends to produce then also a state of focus that we can call hyperfocus, where you go down rabbit holes very easily. Sometimes when you're stuck in work, then you realize that you thought you were on a good track, and then you wasted an hour or two. You know, I know it could be. You're doing writing a paper and you end up doing an extra hour of research on Wikipedia, <laughs> or you're trying to like look something up. And there's a satisfaction emotion sometimes where you just feel like, oh, okay, at least I'm making some progress here. Well, all of this is what I call threat mode. Fortunately, 
you know, neocortex, right? You know, there's the, the most underreported part of the brain uh, is in the textbooks, uh, the neuroanatomy textbooks, but you don't hear much about it, the appraisal center, the, or the, the ventral medial prefrontal cortex. It lights up when you deliberately reappraise a threat as an opportunity. It's under voluntary control. In an fMRI machine, you can have a person complaining about something, dwelling on the negative, and then you ask them, reconsider this thing. In what way is it giving you an opportunity to grow, to learn, to practice? And if they can discover an opportunity in it, so you might be, you know, we're going to go through some examples in a moment, but you could be complaining about how heavy the groceries are, but then you could rediscover in it a naturalistic workout. Like this is exactly the kind of workout that I've been looking for in my core and my arms. So, okay, this is going to be good for me to walk home with this heavy thing. Well, it means you widened the context to see it now. It's not just about getting the groceries home, but it's about the whole thing, a wider thing. So, reframing will look for some kind, something you can get better at, some kind of skill, or quality, or virtue that you can improve in, widening the context to see that. But that does then, it ends up opening you to higher ideals, to be thinking about the kind of person you want to be. What are, for you, those virtues that somehow resonate the most and pull you the most as being beautiful qualities? We'll go through a little thought experiment in a minute. It's going to make you also more creative, of course, to have a growth mindset. You can think about new ways of doing things. When you're reframing a task as a new kind of opportunity when you sit down to work, you're actually starting to ask yourself, what would it look like to do this in a new and better way? Which you can't do in Fredman. And just asking that question gets you out of Fredman. It lights up your appraisal center. Now you're discovering a new opportunity. And it leads to a growth mindset. You, you start to see everything in terms of trajectories of growth and that you could get better at things. It will get easier. Your attention will then be more focused as your ventral medial prefrontal cortex lights up. Right around it, the whole rest of the medial prefrontal cortex. When you're focusing in the present moment, that whole rest lights up. You'll feel calm. You'll be able to do one thing at a time. I call that unitasking. And then when it comes to the task, you'll be more strategic, strategizing the best way of going about it, actively challenging yourself in some way. And it actually leads to flow. So there are these two separate ways. One is more of an opportunity mode, and the other is threat mode. So again, threat mode, these turn on. This other, this other mode, the opportunity mode, these turn on. So just to give you an example of what could trigger this, this would be for if I were on a way to a meeting and I realized that I had made a big mistake and put the pen in. So there now you can see there's this stain that I have to go to the meeting. Well, just in the terms of the meeting, it could seem like it's a very bad thing. And would certainly put you in threat mode. So this is a bad thing happening. Deliberately using a little appearance of a threat that has nothing to do with the task at hand itself, just as more generalizable. Reframing would be somehow asking yourself, okay, now that this has happened, what do I do with it? How can I grow with this? And you're going to think of it in terms of practice, learning, and growth. Okay, so you can ask yourself then, with that statement, what would be a way that I could practice? How is this giving me a chance to live some ideal? Well, the ideals all go by the names of virtues. So it just means something you're using as a goal uh, that is not fully attainable, but guides you in the present moment. And so you could think of, well, I could be growing here in my being, you know, being humble, being self-forgetting. If I could be self-forgetting while having a big stain on my shirt, that would be a remarkable thing. That would, anything else would be much easier. To not take myself so seriously, to have a sense of humor. If I could approach this humorously, okay, this is so you can actually see, even with a little simple happening like this, could give you a chance to think in terms of practice, learning, and growth. And you, you come to see it in a new light. You end up being able to say, bring it on. 
and people react if they point at me and my like I'll just walk on it. It'd be a great thing for me to get over my fear of being awkward or embarrassed. And this is a great opportunity to do that. Okay, so then bring it on. You can even know you've refrained because you can say, the more the better. So because you've actually taken what seemed like a difficult thing and you've made it good. What if you are noticing this, the onset of some symptoms? You have a cold that's coming on. You know, these days the pandemic, you know, getting cold can be kind of scary. You ask yourself then, you know, what would getting sick be a chance for practice learning and growth? Well, the optimal work, we did an experiment with 2,500 people where we had them go through this thought, it's like a thought experiment, and we call it the overheard conversation. I'll tell you the way we do it. Imagine that someone that you love most in this world is not knowing your home and able to hear them. Even if your relationship has been tough, now it's closed. And you can overhear them talking on the phone, and they're talking about you. And they're saying how wonderfully well you treat them. What would it make you happiest to hear them say about how you treat them? What words would they use? Everyone said loving, so loving is basically everyone. But what else besides loving? This is what we found: seventy-four percent of people was reliable. That surprised me as well. But encouraging, caring, understanding, patient, thoughtful, cheerful, generous, wise—these are all the top answers. These are ideals that people will find very motivating. And if you would ask someone to think of just the top two or three of this. Because those are the ones you can reach to in any moment. And you can ask yourself, whatever the challenge you're facing is, how is this giving me a chance to practice being, well, think of the example of the person getting sick. What does that give you a chance to practice? I thought maybe being patient, being cheerful. You can be cheerful when you're sick. You are deeply cheerful. Okay, so that's a wonderful kind of training. You can be generous to others while sick. You know, not so many parallels of recovery, but, but within reason, you can be thinking, okay, this is a wonderful thing for me to do. The thing about ideals is that in light of an ideal, challenges become good, and you can say the more the better. So this is, reframing is not reassuring yourself that you'll be okay. It's not substituting thinking, well, this will get, I'll be done with this, and then I'm going to have a nice vacation. Or you just think about something else. It's not positive self-talk of repeating things to yourself. Reframing is the essence of cognitive therapy. And you actually have to discover how the difficult thing is good. It's giving you an opportunity to grow. Now, the things people complain about the most and dread the most, well, those are the biggest challenges they face. We only complain about challenges, but challenges are the only way to grow. The reason this thing is difficult for you at this moment is because your growth lies there precisely right now. So you can end up saying, bring it on. This is a, the perfect way for me to grow right now. Now let's get into then to say what we know so far. So reframing brings the light of ideals into any threat. Reframing widens the context in which we view the present challenge. Faith provides both ideals and the widest context, allowing us to reframe any and every challenge. Therefore, faith is what perfects reframing. Ultimately, reframing is made permanent by faith because it allows you to see every challenge you're meeting as you go hour by hour through your day as the providential challenge for you. It is the perfect challenge. It's been selected. The ideals that faith enlightens in our minds are the ideals that this challenge will bring out in you. That's how you've been living. Reframing is a skill of the practical intellect. 
And faith is what perfects the intellect. I think that the way that we practice faith most often in a day is refraining. Because it's being able to, whenever you notice yourself tempted to complain about something, to discover in it the providence of God. So you can see somehow in his wisdom, this is actually the best thing for me right now. It's my best opportunity to go. Now we're going to mindfulness. The second part about attention here, when you're activating your prefrontal cortex, mindfulness is the activity. It's a skill that lights up the whole of your prefrontal cortex, stabilizing your attention. So you can hold your attention in the present moment. What I mean here by mindfulness is a very simple thing. Letting your attention be on one thing, and when another thought enters your mind, you detect that, gently let go of it, and re-anchor on the one thing. That's a very technical definition of mindfulness, but it has three movements. You detect an intruding thought. You say you welcome it. You release it gently, not just shove it away, but just let it go. And then you re-anchor in the present moment. Which is, what that feels like is you just wait for the next thought to arrive while anchoring on something. And normally we use the breath. So the breath is because the sense of touch doesn't have associations with it. If you go try to be mindful of sounds and sights, sounds and sights produce lots of thoughts. And it's it just to get more and more thoughts going. Closing your eyes, being in a quiet place, or have noise canceling headphones. And opening up to the sensation of the breath, particularly in the chest, that doesn't have any associations with it at all. So mindfulness is the simplest form of work. It's work that has only one step, attending to the breath. But when another thought enters, you detect that, let go, and reattend. When you do that, this is what happens. This is an example of, um, this was a, a recording I did actually, my heart rate. And in exactly 40 seconds, I turn on my ears. I want you to see, it's just my heart rate being graphed. It's like, you know, mostly in the 70s, 70 beats per minute. The moment I turned on mindfulness by just opening up to the sensation of the breath in my chest, you see the heart rate plunges but then it comes right back up, and then it plunges again, and then it comes right back up. So there's a sine wave in your heart rate when mindfulness is turned on. This is very easily verified. There are free iPhone apps you know, that, uh, that will show you this. It's called coherence. And what's cohering essentially is the beating of your heart with the moving of your breath. And as you exhale, almost as if to conserve energy, your heart then, because that you've gotten the oxygen from that breath, your heart slows down as you exhale. And then you, you inhale and you fresh blood, it goes right back up. And then as you exhale, it goes down. If while watching this, you made your own breath go with the up and down, you'd learn the right exact time for what the breath should be when you want to be coherent. It ends up being about a Four seconds in, you gently you know, round the corner for one or two seconds, and then four seconds out, and then round the corner for one or two, and then four seconds in. But you don't want to be overly careful about counting the breath or anything. All you want is to get into a slower pace, then let go, and open up to the sensation. People who have very severe anxiety disorders, like obsessive compulsive disorder, which is a patient of mine, have zero heart rate variability. There's no up and down from any other exhale. This is a measure of parasympathetic activity. That's the calming part. So this is actually partly what turns out threat mode in the whole rest of your body. Reframing already activates parasympathetics briefly in a burst. Then mindfulness holds it on for a while. Mindfulness is the best thing you can do to get your attention whole and entire so that then you can transfer it to the task. So you hold it, 
And then generally, it will be less and less jumpy. And it's going to be easier and easier to hold it down. How long do you have to do it for? Maybe 30 seconds, maybe three minutes. It's worth the investment. It's like pulling back on a bow. You're adding potential energy to the system. Yes, there's no forward movement, but it pays off in the long term. And so mindfulness, actually all the steps of the golden one are very much a pulling back on a bow. When you sit down to work, you just want to jump in and get it done. And so that's tends to be rushing and multitasking and very much part of being a friend of values. Learning how to pause at the beginning of time of work. Reframe the task you're about to do as an opportunity. How? How can this bring out the best of you? And then mindfulness, settling the mind. And then you end up getting this kind of beautiful pattern in your body. And you end up feeling calm, but that's not exactly the goal. The goal is just practicing, detecting, releasing, and removing. That's why distractions and mindfulness are not a problem. They are the practice. The more times you get to detect an intruder, let go of it, and gain it, the better practice you got. So people often think that mindfulness is only working when you can just be perfectly silent in your head for 30 minutes without any thought stirring, and then leave feeling really relaxed. No. You want the best practice you can get. And the best practice means detecting, releasing, and moving. You do that, eventually you'll notice that your mind does get less jumpy. The background processing from the default mode network, where all distractions and impulses come from, does get turned off gradually for people's. But that just happens as you practice those three routines. So what we know then about mindfulness. Mindfulness is all about bringing the fullness of your attention into the present moment. Mindfulness progresses from awareness of your breath to awareness of the whole life in your body, finally to your awareness of your act of being. The highest kind of mindfulness is a, the awareness of your ising, that you, you are, and that, that can have that act of being that makes you actual right now, is what in many traditions, East and West, say is the highest form of mindfulness. St. Paul in the Areopagus, when he's trying to show the, the people there how to become mindful of God, he mentions, for in him you have your breath, your life, and your being. And in him you live and move and have your being. It's the same kind of tribe. Breath is more simple movement. So it's actually, he repeats it twice in his very short speech. So he also, if you look at Hebrews, in the, uh, in the letter of Hebrews, describes hope as piercing the veil of the present moment and anchoring our attention in God, who upholds it. So the hope actually pierces behind the curtain to the inner sanctuary where God lives. Hope, in a sense, you can immunitize as the essence. The good meaning of that is it brings eternal life, the awareness of eternal life, into the now. It's less about the future in this case. It's more about the now, but it's a deeper now, an eternal now. Hope is the virtue that allows us to see that to hold our attention, not just in the present moment, but behind it and what it holds the present. So hope is actually the virtue that perfects mindfulness. St. John the Cross says the same thing. So that is basically hope perfects memory, which is the power here, by annihilating it. And then annihilates it by holding it in the act of just the present moment. So you're only aware of what's present. You're not aware of the past or future bouncing around in your head. That's non-being. The present moment is being. And so hope is what anchors you in the now in being, freeing you from not being. So that's hope and mindfulness. The next step is challenge. Now that you have calmed your mind, you have a positive view of the task, you calmed your mind, that may have all taken a minute or two. The most important step is the challenge step. And to go through what this looks like, 
you need to lay out some of the steps of the task you're about to do. You break it down. So you think about it, next time you're sitting down to work, think about your hour's work that's ahead, and then you divide it up into several steps. That is how you learn to strategize things, to be creative and put order into them. You actively challenge yourself by setting a bar in your task. Now, setting a bar means asking yourself, what's my previous best way of doing this? And how can I do it a little bit better? It's like if you're coaching a pole vaulter. How do you help a pole vaulter to get better at pole vaulting? Well, there's a ball that you have to slightly raise by a centimeter or two from your personal best. Right? That's what draws out the pole vaulter's best energies. If you were to do it way too high, it'd be unreal and demoralizing or just not effective. And then two lows, similarly on demoralizing. So you need to have a bar. What do you think of a pole vaulter that was practicing about setting the bar? It'd be silly. It'd just be throwing it around your body and landing on your mattress. So that would serve no purpose. Well, from our brain's perspective, that's often what we're doing when we just go to work without having a sense of, okay, what exactly am I doing? Yeah, and how can I challenge myself in the work I'm about to do? This is very much closely related to something in psychiatry called behavioral activation, which is the treatment for depression, but, but, it, but it works for all negative processes. But it essentially means that the challenge in the person's life has to move from the external passive to the internal active. So they have to find a way to challenge themselves in small actions. And then progressively increase it. It's the most effective treatment for depression. And some people will say, well, no, maybe ECT is better, but, but behavioral activation works on any severity of depression. And even people who just had cognitive therapy to deal with their thoughts, uh, in the end, people who did the behavioral activation alone end up having more positive thoughts as well. So there's some interesting studies on this. Behavioral activation is very powerful, and we need it at the beginning of every hour of work. And you get it from setting a challenge. The challenge in the work will actually give you the pattern for your dopamine systems to now kick in. And as you make progress towards that goal, you get more dopamine. And if you are part of that, is setting a deadline too for in this hour, this is what I want to do. You get increasing dopamine as you get closer to it. The last part then is embracing the stretch. So you have to ask yourself when you're starting a task, what would it look like to stretch myself in this task? You could have a quantity stretch or a quality stretch. And those speak to different halves of your mind. The left hemisphere responds to quantity stretches, which is like, say if you're going to be reading, then it could just be reading instead of four pages an hour i'm going to read eight pages an hour so you set a quantity goal all that will happen is your brain will try to make everything more efficient it doesn't necessarily improve the task or improve your learning but trying to read in such a way that you remember everything you read or to attain deeper understanding setting a quality goal how could i do the most the deep intake, digestion of any passage that I've done. There are ways that, of doing this, I think, but uh, other people have questions. But you can shape the task of setting a quality goal. Any task can receive any quality. You could even be practicing you know, being cheerful while reading a book. How do you practice that? Well, in that case, you'd have to practice it very inwardly. So when, if you got distracted or you got tired, you'd respond to that in a more compassionate, kind, cheerful way. But there's always a way of practicing ideas in any task. Sometimes it's just inward, sometimes it's dealing with other people, sometimes it's putting more order into the task, holding your attention with greater intensity or constancy. There's always an idea. What we know 
us a challenge focuses our effort. It actually puts us completely into the task at hand. So the simplest way of getting your attention to stay in the task is to raise the challenge. It needs to be in a meaningful way. Raising the challenge is a quality challenge. So what's the skill or the ideal or some bond of the deepening this task? That actually is the best way. So challenge sets a bond in the task. So you can get the right amount of stretch. Now that stretch is what puts us into flow. Flow requires stretch. Now you can learn them to get good at estimating for yourself what's the right level of stretch in the task. And when you set that goal with a positive frame and some mindfulness, having settled everything, then that stretch goal puts you into flow. Charity, however, identifies the stretch in the upcoming task with the cross. The challenge is the cross. So to embrace the cross in this task is to let yourself be lifted up and stretched out by the task. So there is a deep theology of the cross in the heart of understanding the work. In some sense, it is the key. Because that means that any challenge, no matter how painful it could be, is only more identifiable with the cross. So charity ends up allowing us to have ever greater love. But how does love increase? Only by being fully exercised. In an hour of work, how do you exercise it? By embracing the stretch of love. So it ends up that from, from the Catholic perspective, we are able to then see in every hour of work, the same thing that happens in the Mass. We get identified with the Son, offered in the Spirit to the Father. So that every hour of work is reproducing the Mass. And it's not only in a real way to it. Charity is what perfects challenge. So this is what turns all challenge into love. So we've been talking tonight about faith and psychology working together. And I've been discussing here three psychological skills, reframing, mindfulness, and embracing the challenge, as being the key teachings of cognitive behavioral therapy. But each of those is then perfected by a theological virtue. Reframing is how we bring ideals into a, any challenge, any upcoming time of work, and it's how we widen the context to see it in terms of our ultimate goal. Faith in that sees the widest possible context, the whole of our life, the afterlife. It sees the will of God in everything. Mindfulness is how we enter the present moment fully, leading our imagination in everything, anchoring ourselves somehow in the present moment. And hope stabilizes that by anchoring us in even more deeply in the presence of God. Challenge means setting a bar to stretch yourself in every task. But charity sees in the cross and embraces the love. My patron Saint Saint Maria Escobar said, "Our life is to work and to pray, or the reverse, to pray and to work." Because the moment comes, one cannot distinguish between these two concepts, contemplation and action. They end up meaning the same in one's mind and conscience. The most amazing thing is that what flow is in action, that actually is contemplation. Contemplation is flow with faith and hope and charity and living. It raises it, this flow to a higher level. The condition to be in flow is you have to be working at your best. Stretching yourself even beyond that. The condition for contemplation in work is precisely that. You have to be working at your best for ultimately the highest purpose. That's a high note to end on. So with that, thank you for your attention. I'll be happy to get any questions here.
All right, well, thank you so much. Can everybody hear me? Um, let me begin. We had a number of questions around this. Um, is there some level of objective, an objective situation of agency and control over one's circumstances that is necessary as a precondition um, to uh, practicing reframing mindfulness and challenge? So for, for example, within work, um, can you think of a situation where somebody just does backbreaking work in a mine 12 hours a day, six days a week, uh, somebody sells a product that's maybe not a bad product, but it's not a good product, and they only get paid when they sell it, and so on. I mean, this type of, of situation where one has very little agency over it, um, is it possible to practice this? So it's a wonderful question about do you can you reframe and be mindful and challenge yourself in a situation over which you have no control? And the answer is yes. There is, these are internal behaviors that touch on the ultimate freedom we have as persons, and that nothing actually can take away from us, not even psychosis. So even things that are the most challenging in us, actually they still can respond, reframe mindfulness and challenge. So we do now have psychological treatment, CBT, for the, the toughest conditions there are, where people have no, in a sense, control over the things they're suffering. And sometimes they're suffering things that we couldn't even imagine. And still, reframing is asking yourself, how could this bring out the best in me? But how can I see in this the little dots in this right at the right this moment? Now that doesn't mean you don't never change your external situation. So it, it can be perhaps the thing that you most need to practice is a new kind of assertiveness. There could be that there is a new kind of courage, a new kind of creativity that you need to be engaging in. So this by no means is saying just bear whatever things, but it is saying that we need to never complain. So complaining is the opposite of reframing. Where reframing takes the threat and discovers the opportunity, complaining takes even opportunities and turns them into threats. It's a negativizing. It's the complaining is the neurological mirror image inverse of reframing and what it does. Complaining shuts off the enemy of the prefrontal cortex. Actually, interestingly, Complaining, when you shut that off, you lose parasympathetics, you actually have less activity of natural killer T cells. And that means you're more susceptible to viruses and cancers. <clears throat> so complaining is actually the most destructive habit you can have at the physical level, I would say. Uh, and it is the origin of all anxiety and depression and other psychological disorders. Now, I'm not saying those things that we can blame people's complaining. I'm just saying it's the habit of negativizing that one way or another, maybe they learned it when they're very young, but the habit of negativizing and dwelling on it, the brain gets better and better at doing whatever you practice doing. It's called neuroplasticity. So if you practice seeing things in a negative way, your brain gets really good at it. And that's called the negative processing bias. So the flip of that is reframing. So reframing the mindfulness challenge give us new freedom, I would say, no matter what is happening. In a way, you've really answered this, this question um, in a more general way, but I want to respect the question by asking in particular about trauma. Um, and are there particular structural barriers in the brain that might be a result of trauma? Um, and um, are there, is this the best strategy to train and change the soul after internalizing deep damage um, and to come to the, have the capacity for trust and joy and faith above? So the shortest answer I can give would be trauma needs reframing more than most conditions and benefits from mindfulness more than most conditions. 
So the sense of reconnecting with the body is a physical or sexual trauma, you know, and being able to trust your own body again and to trust your feelings, you know, or at least to not even trust maybe as so much as to experience them. Because trauma can lead people to be somehow separated in a way from the body. Like there's been a loss of rapport between the person and their own body. Mindfulness actually is capable of building that rapport. So what I present to people in the benefits of learning how to focus on the next task you're doing, and then <clears throat> to enough reframing and mindfulness and challenge at the very beginning of that task as much as you can. The good thing about that approach is it's not overwhelming for anyone because it's dealing with things. You're not dealing with trauma at work. You often are dealing with overwhelming memories. And the treatment is prolonged the exposure of those memories. Very healing and healing, very radically healing. But this is trying to get at the same underlying benefits in a safer way by practicing these meta skills, the psychological meta skills, reframing, mindfulness challenge. They apply to all things in life that are difficult and help us to make them good. Um, there were a couple of questions about. Um, uh, being trapped by thoughts, um, inability to sleep, and, and so on. Um, so here's a, here's a question specifically, uh, what do you do if you're trying to sleep um, and thought, thoughts about stressful things um, uh, keep popping into your mind? Is something such as getting out of bed and journaling thoughts appropriate? Okay. So super common question we get now. So the last few years have been very tough on people's sleep. Uh, and so naturally it happens that people are busy typically during the day. And then when they go to bed, that's when then unprocessed things come to mind. And so the question is, should you be processing things at that moment? You know, get out of bed and be journaling. I think in all things, you know, people should see what works for them. And if they experiment with that, and that's a very effective thing, it doesn't cut into sleep too much. I guess I would be okay with that. However, I do think that there's a skill that helps people fall asleep. And it's a kind of mindfulness. So there are different kinds of thoughts. One comes more from the left brain, and one comes more from the right brain. The left brain thoughts are going to be problem oriented, seeking a solution and trying to get you to do things. So you, and so when people feel like they're when they're worrying or ruminating, those are very much left brain thoughts. And the way you know is that they're all verbal. And so the left brain is what has verbal powers. And so you end up then thinking and thinking and thinking in words. It can be tough to make the words stop, right? Mindfulness, what reframing, mindfulness, and quality challenges are all right brain. Reframing is right ventral medial prefrontal. Mindfulness also is primarily right when you're sensing the body. So, this idea of learning to be mindful of the thoughts that come from your right hemisphere, you know, this is sound weird, but those thoughts are multi sensory. They will have sound, even, and they will have there'll be there'll be something that is more visually engaging they're phantasms in the classical sense of the word so they're multi-sensory they bubble up as fragments and eventually one of those bubbles catches your attention and you are pulled into the dream in your sleep and that's what we all go through every night we fall asleep we're just sitting there and then before we know it our mind was off it got caught into one of these kinds of thoughts. They're called hypnagogic thoughts. Actually, is it my word? I have a podcast called The Golden Hour on Spotify and others. The second to last episode was on this skill of sleeping. So if you want to see more of the description, I would say that. It's a practicable skill to learn how to be aware of these thoughts. And there are different traditions that can work with. I'll just perhaps leave you with that. Um, so, one set of questions is about what about tomorrow and next week and next year? Um, what kind of mentoring is commonly necessary for uh, people to actually 
make this a practice um, that makes a difference over time? And how would you, would, um, what sort of analogy might there be between that kind of mentoring and spiritual direction that gives us such uh, importance in the spiritual life? So everyone would benefit from mentoring, just as everyone would benefit from spiritual direction. The commonality of mentoring and spiritual direction is that they take place in conversation. And those conversations will tend to have, I think, if they're at their best, certain stages. The first stage is that the person is working to deeply understand what is the main challenge we're facing right now. And then they are in some way encouraging. They help you to be optimistic that change is possible, growth is possible, they're uplifting. This is all part of being encouraging, but they can show you what will get easier in time. And even inspiring, they can show you how the highest ideals can be built in this. Or at least they help you to discover it. So a good mentor or spiritual director is understanding and encouraging. Encouraging is where the reframe takes place. And they are helping you essentially to reframe it. And then lastly, they're practical. They help you come up with some way of concretizing this new vision you have of growth being possible. So I think that those are irreplaceable things. This, you always will benefit from having an outside person who can help you understand the challenge you're facing. You might not understand it. You know, I, I need it too. And you know, I've been teaching this to thousands of people for a very long time years. But, uh, but you still need it yourself. But, uh, but hopefully you can find someone who can be understanding, encouraging, and practical. Now, I think that just to get good at reframing, that is a very, that on its, on its own is a very practical skill. And on optimalwork.com, I actually have a tool called the Reframer, which I think can help people reframe any challenge. So I'm just walking through the steps, some questions that help you to think about it in a new way. I think that there are like, so I made tools available to people in optimal work so that they can learn how to do this. I think it's learnable. If you just sat down and you always had like reframing mindfulness challenge, just have some way of quickly doing that, thinking, okay, the task you're about to do, how is it giving you a chance to learn, practice, grow, be mindful of your breath for a minute or two, and have a really clear practical challenge of how you can stretch yourself through this task, you would quickly get good at it. These are, these are skills that are very meaningful. And the main skills people go to therapy to learn how to do. I actually don't think people need therapy to learn reframing mindfulness and change. There are many ways of learning how to do those things now. So there are many free resources on YouTube. Just look at mindfulness. There, there are, there are, there's a lot of good ways of learning how to do it. So it doesn't necessarily need a formal, expensive course of therapy. But it can be good. So here's a question that comes from uh, the perspective that all things are in God's hands. Um, and the question goes like this. Many Christian messages focus on God resolving our difficulties. Um, uh, now or eventually eternally in some way. Um, are these messages or similar ones compatible with reframing? I love that question. I think that the problem with many approaches is that they're still thinking in terms of challenge reduction. If you try reducing a challenge, then one, it stays external to you. And then two, it stays negative because you only try to reduce negative things. Anything you do to, to like escape a challenge or reduce it ends up working against you. So the best thing is to ask yourself, what is the most beautiful way for me to thrive in this challenge? Aristotle in the Nicomachean Ethics says that you don't need to have ethical theory to become a virtuous person. What you need is an image of the Quran. The Kalan is the beautiful, the noble, the golden way of acting before you start acting. And once you see the image of the Kalan, then that is what you're aiming for. It's actually summarized, I think, what my whole presentation has been so far. That's the idea of the golden knowledge. It's like the Kalan knowledge. So the idea here is that you want to see what it means to embrace this challenge in the most beautiful way. 
well, then why would you ask God to bless me? And you know, if it's his will be lessened, then so okay. But uh, but I think that our tendency to make challenges negative and to be complaining about them. Yeah, I, just, I don't see it as compatible with the robust theism. Um, what about the vice of rashness, though? And, uh, you know, I think we do want to reduce unnecessary risks in life. Mm -hmm. um, I've spent my life in the investment business. It's one of the things that we try to do <laughs> is identify risks and avoid yeah. them. So there is a side that, of that that's good. Yeah, so this is not to say that the only way of growing is by doing more daring. So, but in some way, when you think about what courage is, courage is actually your willingness to embrace a difficult day. And so that's what we're talking about here is challenge is a difficulty and making it good is what we frame it as. So it does give us courage, but I don't think it leads to rashness because it's not what you, you think of the whole picture of what is the best way for me to thrive in this moment. Um. The, um, it's a question about evolution. Um, what would have been the evolutionary use of the appraisal center? So 50,000 years ago, everything that approached you might have been a real threat. Mm -hmm. So uh, why was the appraisal function needed? How, how did that become part of us? That's a great question. I don't know this is probably the best answer. I think that uh, there, when you're trying to look at questions in the brain and you ask yourself, like, how does this fit into evolution? Well, even the amygdala itself, that it received input, way silly, I didn't get into the neuroscience here, but the three ways your upper cortex reaches into the amygdala correspond to reframing mindfulness in general. So it's, it's how you end up teaching your amygdala. When you're reframing a, something, a, a threat as an opportunity, your ventromedial prefrontal cortex goes right through your interior cingular, deep into your amygdala, and helps it do safety learning very quickly. Because you're consciously seeing it as a threat, and now your amygdala is seeing, oh, okay, this person thinks it's a good thing, and then you can rapidly get through it. So, same with mindfulness. There's another area that goes into the amygdala and gives it another lesson. So, what purpose would that have served in some, some uh, homo sapiens that didn't have language, that didn't have like a developed rationality? Only in humans is the amygdala trainable by the upper cortex. In no animal do you see the amygdala being trained by the upper cortex of that very animal. That's a remarkable thing. We are completely different. And all our animals, and how our lower and upper brains relate to each other, and in how our posterior and anterior brains relate to each other, and in how our left and right brains relate to each other. The human brain is actually three different overlapping axes. So, the first one is put correct actually by reframing, the next one by mindfulness, and the next one by quality change. So, there's a very deep neuroscience behind what you heard so far tonight. There's just no time to talk about all of here. So, but in the, how does this relate to evolution? It's a great question. We just, I have never seen a good answer. Maybe it relates to singing. I don't know. Lots of weird things come about because humans were singing for like 3,000 years before speech or something. So, there's a lot of things we don't know. <laughs> well, let me ask one final question. Um, how did you first develop the idea of optimal work? Um, uh, is there a story from uh, your life that sort of brought you to this realization? Well, optimal work was after having felt like I understood anxiety very thoroughly, and I could help basically everyone who came in for anxiety. And then wanting to see there must be a way of spreading this, because the, the stuff I had taught myself even and how to face up to any kind of fear was so useful. But then this, that helping students one-on-one, -on -one, uh, and I mentored a lot of Harvard students and MIT students over the years, and it's starting to see lots of commonality there. For me, probably also, 
the idea of taking the work and seeing that that is the hinge on which growth turns in our life, so much of our character growth depends on how we approach growth. And that was something I learned from Jose Mir Escobar. So reframing, I actually read first in a book called The Way, and he said, don't say that person annoys me. Think, that person sanctifies me. I read that when I was 18. And that was the first time I understood reframing as a concept. When I went to medical school, that stuck with me always. And so there, there was a deep sense in which there are these lessons in what it means to, to see a higher possibility for sanctity in any activity. Same with mindfulness and these things. And you talk importance of learning to see and to feel God in yourself and in your surroundings. That's actually not that's and it struck me exactly as one of those. So I have to say that I got a lot of insights from in, in, in how these things are actually practiced. Now the that is very highest. I think reframing, if you go to the deepest and highest part of me, is actually the desire for God. Because what is the best you can find in any situation? It's God. There's a quid to the hidden divine something in every situation, it's God. So it ends up being then, you, by desiring God all day long, you're continually reframing. And no matter what comes at you, you're desiring God. Either. That's the height also of what's called affective growth. So that you're learning to go from meditating, that you read and meditate in, in a silent time prayer, and you get to more affective in your heart and to be more sincere in what you tell God. Gradually, you left with a silent desire for God. That gets the next part, which is silence. That's what mindfulness ends up being about. And learning how to be in silence in prayer, which is called the prayer of quiet. John the Cross always said, go from desire to silence. And then the last stage is the fire of contemplation. So it was just love. So you can see that that, in my mind, then experiencing prayer and seeing well, what happens in flow in life and what happens in prayer is the same thing. And even it starts to feel like it has the exact same content, but it's still about God. So whether it's work, whether it's prayer, you can't tell the difference anymore. You know, in it. So that last quote I had, I think that was um, a very important experience. Good. Well, thank you so much. A few words from here, if I can. <clears throat> well, thank you all for being here this evening. Um, and thank you, Dr. Majors, for this wonderful conversation. Um, coming soon, I want to extend a warm uh, invitation to, our, to the next event in our sacred music series on Sunday, March 6th at 3.30 Eastern, uh, a choral Vespers service featuring music of North Italy, including Monteverdi's renowned Dix Dominus, will be at St. Paul's Church and live stream. St. Paul's Choir of Men and Boys will sing the best Vespers, which will be preceded at 2.30 by a lecture and Q&A by Professor Thomas Kelly of Harvard and James Kennerly, the music director at St. Paul's Choir School. On March 9th, uh, at 7.30 Eastern, uh, here in Di Giovanni and live stream, uh, we will present the sixth annual Daniel Harrington SJ Memorial Lecture. Professor John Levinson of Harvard Divinity School speaks on recovering biblical love from emotionalism and eroticism. Join us either in person or virtually. See harvardcatholicforum.org for information and online registration. And uh, support us there with a uh, by giving us a donation. Uh, and if you haven't done so, uh, sign up for our newsletters to receive announcements of future events. Thank you again for joining us and have a good evening.